so much for your time. I've been a massive fan of yours and I think a lot of my patients and clients uh, thank you already. Um, this for me, your book has been uh, like a Bible regarding uh, how the actual neural drive works and how the nervous system works in so many ways. Um, and it's, yes, it's it's not only, uh, you, you, you say it's a new system of musculoskeletal treatment, it's, I think it's the, 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 the foundation for how every practitioner should uh, find a method to actually find a way to better as a, as a practitioner. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, it, it yeah, the book, the book is a kind of a, at that time was a, a relatively new system, but what I hope's not new about it is that we're applying mechanisms to people's symptoms and how they move. And if we can put all those together and if we can fix the right mechanism and the right patient in the right way, then we'll help the patient. And so we, you know, so for me, systems are really good because they're more efficient, et cetera. But for me, systems should also have, be flexible for the patient's uniqueness. And so if we can make that flexibility a scientific basis uh, as well, then to me, it's a good system. As, you know, as long as we have exclusion criteria and inclusion criteria, because my job, even though it's in heavily in neurodynamics, it's not to sell neurodynamics. It's to offer people skills on how to figure out if it is a neurodynamic aspect or it's not. And the, the joke about that is that's called diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really not about selling an approach or op occupying a political position. It's about developing the skills to solve problems, which mean include or exclude based on the facts. Would you say and that it, it's a toolbox? Because I see it as a toolbox rather than a tool. That's a good one. Um, yeah, I, I like the idea of toolbox because there are a lot of different possibilities w within the approach. Um, uh, I think some might argue it's a modality specific approach. Um, although I hope that it's not practiced just as a modality because you know, n nerves don't move without a musculoskeletal system. You know, they, you don't see people doing a slider of their median nerve or their lumbar nerve root as they walk down the road and get on a bus or a train or drive a car or, or, or go or, or work or play sport. And so the techniques that we use in neurodynamics are not functional. Or many of them are just not functional. They're designed to produce an effect in the nerve so that it can affect other tissues as well, which obviously is a, is a good thing in the right patient, but um, it, it, it still has its limits because it's not, it's not really how we move. 100%. And so uh, my feeling is it has to integrate with how we function. And, and that's kind of a next step. Michael, you're a teacher, you're a researcher, you're a practitioner, when did all this start? Tell me a bit about you. Oh, that's a good question. You know, I remember the moment and the location. It was one of those aha and um, moments. And I was in a, I was 24 years old. Um, I was in working in a public hospital in New Zealand as an employed physiotherapist. I was about, uh, about four years after graduation. And the department I was working was Nelson Public Hospital. And I really enjoyed it. I always enjoyed working in hospitals because I really enjoyed the team situation. And, and uh, the, the physio department had about five or 10 physios and um, they had a little library in the, in, or a bunch of books and, and papers. And every now and then a new paper would come out and say, hey, I found this and we'd all have a look at it and so forth. And I came across a paper written by a physiotherapist called Robert Elvey. And uh, he, he was the first physiotherapist to, he did a cadaver study on the movements of the cervical nerve roots with arm movements. 
and that and he was one of the people who put it forward as a as the straight leg raise of the upper limb and we know about the straight leg raise for lumbar problems but we don't know we didn't know anything about the upper stuff and um so he he put out this paper on how to move the nerves and, and the idea that we might get problems with those nerves and that they might respond to physical treatment. And that was like, poof, wow, cool. And so I started reading at, that, at about that point. And um, then I went to Australia because I trained in New Zealand as an undergrad and went to Australia to do postgraduate training. And, um, and that's where I'm, I became even more interested in nerves, started reading one of my most hated subjects at physiotherapy school, which was physiology. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, look, in my day, we had no computers, no devices. Um, we didn't have rec no recordings. We had to write our own notes at lectures. Uh, and the lecturer would present that lecture uh, whenever on schedule. If you were late, you missed it. And um, if you left without notes, you didn't have any notes. And so, uh, and all the diagrams and anatomy were drawn by the lecturer. We had to copy them. Uh, and so forth. Uh, and if you had enough money, you might buy a big anatomy or a physiology textbook. And it was funny because at the end of the year, there were only two rules, pass anatomy, otherwise they kicked you out, no second chances. And the second one was pass physiology for this on the same basis. Wow. Now, because I hated, no hated physiology. Yeah, well, it's a three hour exam plus an hour in the lab uh, doing cadaver stuff and so forth. And um, I, I was like fine with anatomy, but um, physiology, I hated and did not take any notes. So a month before the final exam for the first year, I was in, in serious trouble. <laughs> and so basically I was heading for failure and I did not want to return to my parents saying, I'm sorry, mum and dad, I failed physiotherapy school and got kicked out. Um, and so, uh, I, don't worry, I got on well with my parents, but I, I didn't want, to, want that failure on my shoulders. And so I studied really hard the following month and bought a, I bought a physiology textbook, of course, and studied it. And, and so now I'm a physical therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I passed. But what's really interesting for me was I suddenly realised how important it was and so that's when I started reading physiology and it was nothing for me to spend 20 hours or about 16, 15, 20 hours a weekend in the library because we had to go home, go into the library, walk in. Uh, there were no, um, there's no electronics except microfish. And, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and, and um, I used to have to go, there's periodicals, the new periodicals, there's a big box. Uh, so a wall of, of boxes with periodicals and used to go there every month or so look up the, the journals that uh, were being published and look, look for new articles and, and we could only photocopy yeah, if we were allowed and so we just go photocopy photocopy and then head home and read you can see and so how important it was to get really good with the foundation the basics you know <clears throat> i think mastery of the basics is is essential even if we go to, say, diagnosis of neuro, neural problems, there are three ways of doing physical testing for this. And the newer one is neurodynamics, of course, but you, know, you palpate the nerve or if you can, and you, you do a neurological evaluation if you can. So uh, if you don't do those, you never know. And uh, I, I like to cook. And one of the people I follow is a guy called Marco Pierre White, who's one of the, the, the fathers of Nouvelle Cuisine and so forth and modern cuisine. And he said it beautifully. He said, perfection is many small things done well. And, you know, if you get the basics right, often you don't have to go to the complicated stuff. And we see on the internet a lot of all this discussion about molecules and all this other stuff. And, well, that's all very good. But how do you treat a patient? You know, how do you listen? And how do you, how do you figure out their symptomatic movements and how to protect themselves or, or mobilise themselves? And, you know, this, is, this is a battlefront battle where we have to apply practical skills. And, and I don't think you can get around clinical skills at the basic level. And that's why I like this, and I'm going to say it again, because you give a foundation, you get back to the basics. And my purpose is people are trying to get on the bandwagon of getting a, a method ready, cut, this is what you're going to do, no critical thinking, follow this, do it. In your book, mm, you're trying to true. give the, the, the basics of how things work. You lay out all the tools, and it's like everybody's different. Mm, mm. Mm. I, I agree. And you can have, say, five people with lumbar radicular diagnosis, 
but they all move differently. And, and so what we have is a, a physical diagnosis, of course, doesn't always link directly to medical diagnosis because you can have an abnormal neurodynamic test, but they don't have a radiculopathy or vice versa. Um, but still, it's a functional diagnosis. They can't do something, help them do it. So for someone that doesn't understand, what can we say that uh, neurodynamics is? Oh, what, yeah, what is neurodynamics? <clears throat> that, I still find that difficult. <laughs> um, it's basically, I've sort of defined it in my book as, is mechanics and physiology of the nervous system as they relate to each other. And, and so if we think on a big perspective, we have musculoskeletal at one end of the spectrum, uh, function, pain, disability, impairments, performance, all that. But if you continue along the opposite end, you have um, neurology, which might be paralysis or a medical disease that gives you a, a nervous system problem. So what I see neuro the neurodynamics doing is connecting the two. And, but in our context, which we're talking mostly musculoskeletal here, it's how the musculoskeletal system functions in relation to nerve, because nerve is a it, it, is a it's dependent on musculoskeletal for optimum function. So uh, it's a it's a non-static environment, which it, yes, yeah, true. Yeah, it's it's a yeah, it's a dynamic environment. Exactly. And and, and you know, nerves can't tolerate certain things that come from musculoskeletal. So you know, a classical easy one is if you lie at night with your wrist flexed and, your, uh, and your, on, you lie on your arm and you wake up with a numb arm or hand, uh, that's, that's, that's archetypal of nerves cannot tolerate compression for very long. Now, if you've got a disc hernia plus a hyperlordotic lumbar spine with lack of movement control, that nerve root's in danger. And so to me, it's like a clinical neurodynamics is how you apply um, mechanics and physiology of the systems, but also how you change MSK for nerve and how you change nerve for MSK because they're dynamically interdependent. So you went and just said compression and nerve and you, uh, I like the way you put it in your book into almost a whole chapter. So if we could say the elongation of a nerve, so let's say increasing um, tension, in three ways, as you put it, if I'm if I'm not uh, wrong, can we explain in a way like in really easy what a nerve can do and what it doesn't like? Oh yes, okay, yeah. Well, they see nerves. Um, nerves. Um, we've actually we've done some studies on this now, and we've we've found the rough, lucky the results are very good. Um, nerves. I'm now starting to say, based on our research, that nerves have the anatomical ability to move independently of other structures which I'm surprised about. So if you look at um, a lumbar nerve root, which would be mostly your area, I imagine, um, then if you do a straight leg raise and just do dorsiflexion at the top of the leg raise, you, you can move the sciatic nerve independent of the hamstrings. Like a braggart, right? Yes, that's right, yes. And so um, we are thinking of nerve movements as one thing, and you can produce sliding effects, tension effects, and so forth. But you can also produce effects in the nerve with the interfacing structures around it. And so if you're thinking of how to move a nerve, you move the neighboring joint, number one. Um, you move its innervated tissue where it terminates, pull on that, number two. And number three is contract the muscles around it or do something uh, to compress it or decompress it, depending on, uh, on what you want to do. But what people need is, is influenced by clinical features, how the, their movements are and how, what provokes and eases their pain. So in, in this case, would you say the anatomical features of in the individual can give different, um, let's say, presentations or on those three um, parts that you just yes. explained? And yeah, how definitely. can we differentiate? That's yeah, that's the, 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 the first question is easy to answer. The second is not. Now, the, 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 when I say first one's easy, I mean that we've studied this in the lab on fresh cadavers and made micro strain measurements and all sorts. And what's really interesting is that you can palpate a cadaver and you can think, oh, damn, because this person's not going to move very well. And surprisingly, it's the mobile soft ones that don't move much. Now, that, that, now MSK, they would, but because their connective tissues are actually quite soft generally, their nerves don't pass forces along their course so well. So moving the nerve 
in point A from using moving a, a tissue at point B doesn't produce much movement at point A because it's all soft and elastic and, and extensible. And so um, if we then palpate another cadaver who's quite firm and, and they're, they're not actually so mobile in the joints, we go, oh, yeah, baby, this is going to be good <laughs> because we're going to get bigger sliding capacity in that nerve. Um, and you know, I, I'm surprised at this um, because that's not what I would have expected, but I've looked. Of similar, similar profiles or um, characteristics, there's still quite a significant variation in how much they move. And so there's great there's variation. Sorry, yep. Um, in the past, when I worked with cadavers, um, the only thing I always thought is I thank them because we're here where we are because mm. of them. But I yeah, think yeah, we definitely. failed them because we took them for in a way for granted that things are that way. Mm. Meaning that a, a, a cadaver will not speak, a cadaver will not uh, walk, move. So mm. are we getting enough information, you think, or we need more, let's say? Ah, that, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, you, we're getting information, and the two questions are, can we extrapolate that to the in vivo situation? And also, what are the magnitudes compared with in vivo? One's a mechanism thing, like does a cadaver express movement as, in a similar way in terms of mechanisms as a human, a conscious human would. But also, if they do, then are the magnitudes any different between fresh or embalmed teal process, fresh cadavers through to in vivo? Um, we, there's, not, there's not much difference really between uh, fresh cadavers and in vivo. Um, but when you get to the teal process and embalm, things change significantly. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed is that the actual effects are all the same, okay. except the magnitudes are different. Mm. And, and, and so you, you, your embalmed cadaver moves less than a teal process. Teal process is quite soft and, and doesn't transmit force so well. So we don't use too many data from those models. Um, but then fresh or fresh frozen are very, very similar and they're very close to in vivo. Now, having said that, that's obviously a passive mechanism because muscles and cadavers yep. don't contract, of course. And so what we have to do is contextualize the data from a cadaver into, or bring it into the in vivo situation and test if it works. And, and so, mm. uh, so the, the in vivo is the context that tests the, the cadaver results. Um, and, um, the, the data in terms of MERS slide are actually quite similar, but what I'm interested in is taking it further, which is into diagnosis of real clinical problems. Um, and that's where you're dealing with perceptions, reports of symptoms with movements, etc. cetera. And um, one of the challenges to, to for instance, um, moving the sciatic nerve in the upper thigh with the Braggard's maneuver or dorsiflexion was that in, in a straight leg raise in a vivo, this person's going to say they have pain and their muscles are going to contract um, during a physical test um, and because it's been measured. Um, and so a, a, an opinion in that situation was, was um, you can't put a cadaver measurement into the in vivo because you're not getting muscle contractions. Yeah. And that, that relates to perceptions. It relates to movement patterns and forces in muscle and nerve as well. But so far, if we think of the studies that do put this into a tested context, the results are still pretty good. Well, they're not pretty, but they're very good. And, and the, the, the one that I'm, two, a couple of studies I'm thinking of are by Paul Liu and Charlie Kornberg in Melbourne, Australia. Quite a while ago, they tested, um, was it Liu, uh, Chris Briggs? Yeah, um, and they tested in vivo the, the, the response to the slump test. Okay. So they put so they put them in the slump position, produced the normal stretch response in the posterior thigh, which is typical, and they changed the neck position, which changes the cord and nerve roots down to the lumbar region. But the idea was that if the muscles are related to the test, then we'll measure muscle behaviour and see if that changes if the neck changes the symptoms. Okay. 
And so if you've got, a, just imagine someone's in a full stretch position producing posterior thigh stretch, which is quite normal. And then you change the position of the head. If you do it sufficiently, it can change the response in the posterior thigh. But uh, as I said, an argument is that that might just be changing muscle contraction. Is it muscle so contraction? Or is, is it going to be what uh, our really good uh, professor says about the underhooks and the uh, over uh, okay well then then you're talking about in a pathological situation or clinical this is this is on asymptomatic subjects yeah so, so, that's so a, it's an, an interventional diagnosis that, that would be the issue of being yeah yeah absolutely now uh, so you've kind of got layers and the first one is obviously cadavers and then there's in vivo normal then there's in vivo clinical or abnormal and so if you look at underhooks and overhooks my feeling is that they don't constitute the biggest component of ridiculous problems. They're a component. I think there's the far more tension-based ones based on compression uh, as the nerve root passes in or near the foramen. Um, but they usually gravitate to producing tension dysfunctions um, rather than upper underhook or, or overhook. Overhook is, a, uh, is an upward sliding, underhook is a downward sliding problem. And, and so Stu and I agree that it might relate to where the pathology is, um, but it's only a specific type of pathology in a location. It's not all of them. And, and so talking about that layer, we kind of are now into the, the normal situation in vivo so people can talk, express their responses, et cetera, and you can measure what they do. And so Paul and, and Charlie um, measured EMG of the hamstrings and did a, uh, a displacement test on the biceps femoris through a trans pressure transducer. So they were able to figure out if muscles were changing while the person's response in the posterior thigh was changing as they moved their neck. Really? So basically... Yeah, so full slump position, posterior thigh stretch, quite normal, hold it there, change the head position, and they say, when I look up, it decreases my posterior thigh stretch, which is typical of a neurodynamic test. And then they measured at the same time while the symptoms changing or the response is changing, what happens to the EMG and the tension in the tendon? Well, there were no changes. And so that was, and I'm not saying let's generalise from this, because you know, a, a, a subject has to be studied extensively. How many subjects uh, from different... were on the on the? Um, I'd have to go back to the study. It was a study on asymptomatics and probably not a large sample. Like, uh, it wouldn't be. A, I don't think it would be a hundred. Uh, it's probably down around the twenty mark. Okay. But the, the, I'd have to go back to the study. Um, and so um, uh, that was an example of going from cadavers to in vivo testing a competitor which is actually what we have to do. You know, it's no good saying neurodynamic tests are valid when you haven't even tested whether they are. Um, uh, and so my position is so far the data are good, but we can't take too much yet until we study it further. Okay. And, and so another one is let's go to the, the pain situation. Oh. Where mu yeah. Well, where muscles and nerves kind of relate to each other. Um, and let's test one and see what the other one does. And so Michelle Coppeter's group and um, Bob Nee, I think it was, did a really one of my one of my most liked studies in terms of trying to figure out if neurodynamic tests produce false positives. Okay. Meaning, so if it's a muscle problem, the neurodynamic test should not be abnormal. Okay. Or you do a neurodynamic test when someone has muscle pain, and it should not change the muscle pain. If it does, then we have a problem with specificity. Okay, so what Michelle and colleagues did um, was put, um, uh, they injected muscles with hypertonic saline, which provokes muscle pain. It's an it's a pain, experimental pain model. And um, the one was in the, the thin arm muscles, hand, mm -hmm. the other one was a gastrocnemius. So they did both ends, different studies. And the, so they put them in the neurodynamic position, the pain, muscle pain was there, and they differentiated it with the neck, and et cetera. And they found it did not change the muscle pain. Mm. Now that is from a specificity perspective, that's good news. And it was in both studies. Now, now another, even further into the pain sciences, for instance, uh, one of the arguments against specificity is that the brain, the spinal cord, produce all sorts of pain responses with, through sensitivity changes. And you can't really do accurate physical diagnosis. That's one of the arguments that's presented quite commonly. Well, this model produces central sensitization. 
but it did not produce a false positive. Wow. Mm. Now, well, having said that, the final line has not been studied because you need to do that in people with long-term, either acute or long-term clinical problems. This is experimental muscle pain. But it's kind of touching into the area we need to step into, which is how, how accurate or valid is the diagnosis in terms of mechanisms. So far, it's looking quite good. And then I will take me back to the, the, the part I was saying, are, are the tests actually good tools to get us where we need to be or to make us be a little more, uh, more biased? Sometimes we're using- yeah, look, yeah, look, I, Yes, look, I'm not a fan of bias um, because I think it, it, finally you get caught out. Uh, you, it might, exactly. but might not be in your own generation, <laughs> but it can, but it could be. And, you know, I'm, I, I, like, I think the best policy is just tell the truth and, yep. and don't take, take things too far because if you do, something's going to go wrong. You, you might be right, but you may also be wrong. Um, and so um, I'm not generalising from this. Uh, what I'm saying is so far, if you examine, you peel the layers of the onion back, then you, you the, so far the data remain good. Now, having said that, let's go to other neurodynamic test studies where there's a known pathology. And so, and the common ones are carpal tunnel syndrome yeah. and lum lumbar and cervical radiculopathy. They're the three most All common studied neural, yeah, exactly, for, for obvious reasons, yeah. Now, it doesn't matter which condition you're considering. Uh, some of the studies show really high diagnostic sensitivity and specificity ratings for um, car detection of carpal tunnel syndrome with a neurodynamic test. Yeah. But at best, they're still imperfect. At the worst sensitivity rating I've seen in the start, the lowest, not the worst, the lowest was 0.45. So that means if you do, say, 100 people, they all have carpal tunnel syndrome, and you do a neurodynamic test on them, only 45 of them show an abnormality. That's what it means. Um, now, that is worse than flipping a coin. <laughs> Yeah, because it's lower than chance. So you got a yes or a no, and you've only got forty-five. So that is, and and so um, what we can say the, the early studies actually showed really good results, but as time passed, more and more people studied it, and the results started to deteriorate. And I think that's partly a result of just bigger samples. We, we now have a bigger sample and therefore more accurate data. And so, and, and if you go to lumbar radiculopathy with a slump test, it's a bit more sensitive than straight leg rays, but it's still not by any means perfect. And so for me, um, what we have is, I think uh, we're, I'm confident now with this statement, um, with the, the results at best are imperfect, at worst they're lousy. Yeah. For, neurodynamic, for a neurodynamic test being used in medical diagnosis, because, you know, carpal tunnel syndrome, radiculopathy, these are medical diagnoses, pathology yeah. and disease. Now, have, however, now that people say, well, gosh, let's give up and go home. And I say, no, <laughs> absolutely not, because these are functional diagnoses. And people come to us for two reasons. I hurt and I've lost function. That is our job. It's one of the most common health problems in the world, pain and loss of function. And so the, the failure, I wouldn't say the failure, but the, the, the thing we were hoping was we'd get a medical diagnosis from a physical test. But that's now been shown ubiquitously to be incorrect and in a lot of other physical tests as well. And so I'm not saying neurodynamic tests are a medical diagnosis. I'm saying they are a functional diagnosis. And that's why I said about bias before in the test, because, you know, we still go, you go to the union, like, oh, let's say if you've got um, um, carpal tunnel or, you know, we're going to do tenos, which I yes, find yes. they have in a way their, their functionality. But I can see that mm. with uh, a neurodynamic test, you've got a bit more information why mm. you've got those symptoms yes exactly now and that's like a massive difference especially for a practitioner because you know what i can have a person that's and you've seen that with a, uh, especially athletes with a lot of muscle and they can do that and they're like oh yeah i've got it but they can do a snatch and keep it there for as long as they want and they will mm. not have anything and then you do yeah. a dynamic test and you're checking you're like oh okay let's go a bit further up and see what's going on Yes, exactly. Now, this is where um, um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of 
um, to, to be a bit more blunt, so how things happen or, or mechanisms. And one of the, one of the um, I think, difficulties, we're at a crossroads in our profession where we're trying to use systems and generalizations for someone that's highly specific. Um, now, uh, systems are great because they're more efficient, but they don't cater for people's uniqueness. Exactly. And so we're trying to use a scalable particle physics model or a drug therapy model to something that is unique to the individual. And, and so part of it's good, of course, but um, uh, this is why I think you cannot get around clinical skills, a decent evaluation of the patient about what's relevant to them. And that includes how they move and how their body functions. And so we have progressions from low to high levels. We have ways of emphasizing different mechanisms and different people. How would you progress to that? Because uh, 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 yeah, good. I'm not going to forget what, like, for example, what uh, Stuart McGill said is like doing neuroflossing, for example, or getting to, into that place is tickling the dragon's tail. I will never forget that. That's a nice term, tickling the dragon's tail. That's good. Yeah, yeah, good. So, mm, okay. So, you don't want it to turn and, and, and burn you. Yes, exactly. Um, so, I'm going to take that question to mean that um, how can we make someone's testing and treatment unique to that individual? Is that what he meant? Yeah, yeah. good. Okay. So, we, for me, there are two things general neurodynamics and specific neurodynamics. They're not mutually exclusive. In fact, specific always works off general. Otherwise, nerves are not Newtonian structures. Okay, that's physics. Um, but there's something about specific that we often need to vary for the patient. And so we do, for instance, someone who has, say they are a runner. Now, so you're so a weightlifter, all right? Weightlifter. Um, and they, and they, you're obviously going to use hip muscles extensively. And um, they have buttock pain. Now, if, if someone, uh, say someone is on a, uh, they have a fall and they land on their buttock, it might be from a ladder at home, and they really hurt their buttock, they get bruising and everything. They, they limp. So you can't treat this person as a weightlifter. Yeah. You're not right now anyway. And so we do something that's pretty gentle and relieves their symptoms to start with, and we build them up. That's so unload. And the next thing is to do a bit of rehab as they improve. And then finally, if they want to get to sport or whatever they, they want, high level where they do performance strategies. And so let's just say the weightlifter or the runner is functioning at a high level, which means their pain is intermittent. When they're walking around at work or at home, whatever, they don't have pain. When they go to bed, there is no pain, which means there's nothing that's severe at the moment that's provoking it. But they get pain after repetitive movements or during repeated movements. So the runner, for instance, or it might be the weightlifter after doing some, some lighter load but repetitive stuff to build endurance for their activity and so forth. And they say, Gee, you know, after I've done a few of these reps, it really starts to ache. But when I stop, it's fine. But the ache's just bad enough to distract me, and I'm never going to perform at a top level if that's going on, okay? So I need to get rid of this little ache, or even might be a sharp stretch feeling locally in the body. doesn't matter. And so we look at them, their musk MSK system, and we think, well, you know, there's only a little bit wrong here. I'm not finding much. But actually, that fits, because if there was something severe, they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the, the mystery should disappear if we can reason it through. Now, and so we think, well, let's, the patient happened to mention that if they do a lot of repetitive stuff, they start getting an ache down their leg into their calf. And if they keep going, they get a, pins, a bit of pins and needles on the side of their heel. Change okay. Yeah. Yeah, now you're starting to think radiating pain, neurological symptoms, maybe there's a neurodynamic aspect to this. Okay, so initially there's a subjective clue or a, a, little, a little alarm bell and, and it, would, it might require further investigation from a physical testing perspective. And so we do a straight leg raise, phew, nothing wrong. But a straight leg raise is a standard test. They are functioning at a much higher level. So of course it will be normal. So at the moment, we have possibly a false negative because yep. we have not, A, gone far enough for them and we have not done something that's highly specific to their movement pattern. So we cannot say we have excluded a neurodynamic problem. And actually, this principle relates to MSK as well. 
And so um, we said, okay, this person actually has been doing plenty of stretches, so they're quite mobile, which is really cool. You know, at least we don't have to work on that. So we take the leg raise up further, and um, we feel we say they say it's a bit of stretch in the buttock and down to the knees. But oh, it's my hamstrings, my hammies, as I say in Australia. Yeah, that's all right. I've had them for a year. That you know, I've always been like that. So when a lot of people say, okay, that's normal, forget about it. But this person doesn't need normal. They need better. And so we have to take them into the better zone or the performance zone. And so we then um, take it way up and it still doesn't show an abnormality. So what we're showing is that the ability of the nerve to lengthen and its sensitivity are pretty, pretty okay. But we have not reproduced piriformis function and have it press on the nerve as, happen, as it happens during their activity. So what we do is we get them into a position, say we get them at the 90 degrees hip flexion because they're really flexible, straighten the knee to bring on the nerve tension, and then we hold it there, but we stretch piriformis during the neurodynamic test. And that's what I call the piriformis straightly raise. Oh, sorry, it's my phone. I'll just turn it off. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I thought I had that turned off. Um, and so, so we have this person high up in the leg raise. Um, we have, um, a, we, we now, uh, we aim to reproduce pressure on the nerve using the local muscle. And so we can, in the straight leg raise position, we can do two things, stretch the muscle while the nerve is under tension. So we would do external rotation of the hip because it's an internal rotator at that point. Mm, below 70 degrees or so, you do an uh, opposite movement for rotation, but above there, we say you've got there. And then at that position where we're stretching piriformis, we say to the patient, okay, now twist your hip and activate the muscle. And so we're, we're lengthening the muscle onto the nerve, they're contracting it onto the nerve, and then they often go, oh, that's my pain. And so you're now reproducing the patient's relevant mechanisms. And so that's the key, particularly in high performance situations. Some, something that I started doing just because I'm just curious, when we do the straight leg raise and I, I do, let's say the same thing with not in a passive way, meaning the patient is not lying down, he's standing. And I would say, can you please start raising your leg? Then people would say, yes, but they're activating the muscles. So then I say, okay, if the person is not having any uh, false negatives, as we said before, mm -hmm. when he's lying, but when he's standing and he's trying to raise his leg, he gets exactly the same pain. Mm -hmm. Is that can be a, like a different SLR? Because it's that's exactly my point when we do x rays and people come with x rays, like, oh, look at the structure, but people are laying down. Okay, what if they're standing? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be the same representation? What if they're sitting down? What if they're on the sides? It's going to be yeah. totally different x rays, yes, right? Exactly. Yes. So exactly. are the tests needed to be? Like, would you see an SLR, if we can call it that way, that a person stands and starts raising its, uh, his leg or her leg? Is it, is it different from a supine straight leg raise, you mean? Yeah, definitely it is. Absolutely it is. Um, I, I guess a generalization might be, if it's in a different position, it's a different test. Yes. <laughs> because your, your body, your vestibular system, your muscles protect, even gravity, your motor tone, everything changes. Your, your forces through your spine change direction and magnitude. And yeah, yeah, for me, it's a different. It's a different test. And and I, but if someone's in a standing position doing active, I will watch very carefully their movement. All the segments, hip joint, hip ratio, hip flexion versus pelvis movement, a rotation of the of the femur, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I would do it compare exactly the same thing on the other side. Yes. Yes, exactly. You, 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 you talked about pain and it's something that actually uh, I've been criticized a lot because uh, people uh, see, for example, that we've done a bit of work with uh, uh, Stuart McGill and they're like, oh, so you're a mechanist or oh, you're, uh, you know, you don't care about what people think and feel. And I see that there are parties now that actually a massive wave of people moving away from the body. Yes, yes, that's true. I've seen that too. And what's what's, what's your position? What's your uh, what's your opinion? What's 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 mm. going on? You've been out there for a lot longer. I'm still a baby, mm. and I, I just don't get it. Um, 
Yeah, it's a difficult one to answer in, in a short, uh, in, a, in a sentence or two, but I agree. I've seen a pendular effect from, um, I'm thinking of the 1980s when I was quite a young physio and training in manual therapy, we were using manual physical techniques to help people help people and I think there's a fair criticism which was look a manual technique's not going to fix structure it's not going to do all this sort of stuff okay that's fair enough um, but over time it can change function and same with act active movements now one of the differences between active and passive is that you can do active much more and, and so the dose for active is often much higher and more repetitive so you, it may have a better potential to change tissues because um, you can't keep going to your local practitioner three times a day uh, to get a push or a poke or a twist and so forth. It's just not practical. Uh, but one of the criticisms also was you're trying to fix the body when pain is an experience. Um, now, it can't, a lot of this comes from Patrick Wall's early work, uh, Ron Malzak's early work on pain, which um, was really interesting because they were very effective and I, I believe justified in arguing that nociceptor activity and pain are not the same thing and they don't always correlate. And that's actually true. But you've got to be careful because a question is, is that a straw man argument? Mm -hmm. um, meaning if you provide a weak argument, it's easy to defeat it. And so let's, let's look at other contexts. Retinal cell activity and vision are not the same thing because retinal cell activity and vision don't correlate. Yeah. It's true. Vision's an experience. Um, proprioceptor activity and position sense are not the same thing. True. Um, uh, thirst and dehydration are not the same thing. Um, hunger and starvation are not the same thing. So close your eyes. Don't worry about how you move. Don't drink and don't eat. Or don't worry about thirst. Don't worry about hunger. Don't worry about what you see. And so what, what's happened is they have applied a minutiae approach to a big problem. Now, um, in certain situations, I think that's actually appropriate, but I, I think there are times we've taken it too far. And, and you know, they say, well, if you chop your finger off, um, you don't always feel pain for a while. Yeah, sure, because you're not still cutting your finger. It's done. And then the inflammation builds up and then you can feel pain, but it's been interpreted as, oh, now that I know I've chopped my finger off, my brain is creating my pain, which you, that, that may well obviously have, have, have truth and validity in it. But um, if, you, if you want to then go to the minutiae, um, uh, there's, a, there's a, an iron channel that if it is knocked out, um, it, it apparently only exists in the carnone nociceptors. Um, and if you knock it out in an animal genetically, these animals do not get mechanical pain. It's the pump 1.5, I think it's called, or something like that. But... Yeah, the one I've seen is Tuckan receptor or something, uh, the Tuckan ion channel. There, there, might be, there might even be a number of them, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, the, but... uh, a lot of kids die or people get really injured because they don't get that. Oh, oh actually, this is um, congenital insensitivity to pain. Is that what you mean? Um... Is that what you... It's, it was, uh, if I remember correctly, they were trying to uh, try to find why people, uh, especially kids, didn't change position. So it would stay like in a flex position for hours and they would get up and that just break everything. Uh, mm. um, you know, I'm not, I hadn't followed that one, but I, I may, it may well be right. Um, uh, what uh, I've seen is one point five, I think I'll, I'll search and I'll put it on. Uh, I'm, in, I'm interested in, in, in that. Um, well, this, if you don't have the specific iron channel, then you can break a leg, you can twist a muscle, you can pinch the skin and they don't hurt. Um, but all their other sensory functions are perfectly normal. Yeah. Uh, thermal, um, uh, proprioception, everything like that. And so there's the idea that um, there's, there's a specific mechano nociceptor that, um, uh, that can register noxious input. Um, now, if you get central sensitization, for instance, this might change where if you get a, an inflammatory problem in a joint or muscle or even an injury, then you might get stimulation of other nociceptors, sleeping nociceptors and some other ones. Um, and then the central nervous system could take over and produce protective responses. 
Um, but what's really interesting is, oh, I don't know about other people, but I've, I've not yet read a paper. I've read a lot of research on central sensitization and all the experimental stuff is produced by nociception. And I'm not saying it would always cause it. We, it's not fully studied, in my, my opinion. But, um, uh, you know, I think we can take things too far. But in the end, let's just uh, be a centrist here and say, sure, some people have a psychosocial driver or some people have a nociceptive driver. My problem is that we're not distinguishing them and we are labelling one the other because we're not testing for it properly, we're making assumptions. And one yeah. of the first cool rules of clinical reasoning is don't assume. Uh, don't Evaluate assume what anything. You see. Evaluate what you see. Mm. And, you know, I'm getting people who are being told, well, I feel sorry for the people that I've seen who have been told that their symptomatic dyskinia is not hurting. You know what? I had a patient yesterday, the same thing. Um, and thank you for saying that. He came in and said that the... Uh, he had L5 S1 representation. He said it's in your head. Uh, no testing, no nothing. That's why they said because he didn't fit the criteria, or whatever. And we just did an SLR and a slump test, and guess what happened? And it wasn't in his head. So mm. I think the use of it, I don't understand when we, we try to divide biopsychosocial, like what's not bio, what's not psych, and what's not social. Mm. Like we we like putting people with specific um uh, labels in order mm. to clarify our bias, I think, or are mm. not being as, you know, Stuart says, a good practitioner, because everything mm. has a cause. Are we mm. able to find it? Mm. And are we so stoic of not sending some a person, some, you know, somewhere else is like, I, I, I cannot find a cause to go somewhere else. Yeah, yes. I think some health practitioners, and I'll follow the medical doctors here, they're actually quite good at saying, we don't know what's doing this. Um, but what a lot of other health practitioners are doing, this is non-specific low back pain. What it really means is we don't know what the is going on. And, and so saying it is non-specific is different from we don't know what's happening. And I think we've jumped into non-specific um, without knowing what's happening, but saying we do. And I, I personally think, um, you know, non-specific might be an appropriate term for some people, but I, I can see people who are told they've got non-specific low back pain when it's actually highly specific. It's directional specific. It's, you know, all sorts of stuff. And, and, and thinking of the psychosocial, what do you get angry in your right L5, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good, great, excellent. Yeah, yeah, great, 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 great example. It, and, so I'm, and I'm not saying psychosocial doesn't affect it. You know, oh, it's, it's a really important area. But um, I think you are, are, people are jumping and, and what we need is more skills and, and being diligent. A hundred percent. Pain is really subjective, right? And it's an experience. And I read a really nice book about how we need to have a more, be more fluent and have a better vocabulary in order to express things. Mm. Because, for example, you would say, I've got pain and for, for someone. And uh, that was uh, on Monday, I had a patient came in. Uh, and we have to ask, you know, from a scale from one to 10. And she's mm. like, she she teached me an amazing, uh, in, in an amazing way about pain is in the way she has said, OK, let's say that I haven't had any pain in my life, like I broke a nail. And someone comes in that they fell from a ladder from six meters. Are we going to have the same one to 10? And I was like, you're hundred percent right. So how do you want me? She said, how do you want, she, she was, she's a pro mm -hmm. strong woman. It's like, mm -hmm. I can go through pain all day. I, my, my training is pain and I'm, I'm conditioned mm -hmm. to that. So how do you mm -hmm. want me to talk about pain? And that's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And you know, you can actually give the, the power into the patient there and say, well, how would you explain your pain? You can use it. You can say anything you'd like. Yeah. And then if they say, this is a descriptor, and you say, well, for me, uh, this is what I'd feel if I felt your pain like that. So how does that gel with what you're saying? Is there, are we connecting here? Or are we not? And, or you might say to them, look, let's just say you've got a bit of pain, but it's not much. What word would you use to describe that? Exactly. And then one day it's a bit more. And then what, what about, what word would you use to describe something that's really holding you back and intrusive and you can't function? 
and, and so they can start using their descriptors. And so, um, look, one of the things that I studied at a postgraduate level, and I'm very thankful for, is clinical reasoning. And um, one of the, we, metacognition is one of the things we study. And um, one of the things I learned was, as a cornerstone of clinical reasoning, is ask open-ended questions, because the, the information you get is more rich. And for example, so how bad, uh, is your pain very bad today? That's only a yes or no answer. But usually there's a gray area between them. You say, how's your pain been? And then you can get a much richer description. Uh, yeah. And, and then you can clarify how you evaluate their words and, and so forth. So communication is a really important part of learning how someone's experience. And that might give you a, an opening to connect with a key point for them. And that might be a motivator for them. And then you could work with that. A hundred percent. And uh, I couldn't agree more with that because the, we're getting into mostly getting numbers or getting scales or getting... But if you cannot communicate the skills in order to get out more information, it just mm. it's uh, it's just a hammer. So everything is going to be just nails. Mm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I, I hate it when my hammer hits all those nails. <laughs> you, we have to take responsibility. <laughs> exactly. We have to do with yeah. You know, we don't sell couches, or we're not. You know, we got a living being that comes in with pain and, as you said, no function or less function. So we need to find a way to make in a way he's life better. Yep, I agree, yes. Um, I know you're really busy. The thing I wanna just talk about is posture and we both, I think are fans of Alf Gray's work. And- Yes, I am. Mm. Um, uh, especially the, the biomechanical subluxations in the way and the tension regarding the, the spine and the nervous system. Um, I wanna start regarding the, the part now that we're, there's a new wave of posture doesn't play matter so mm. it doesn't matter how you move or what you do posture just don't be like the posture police some people say um can you please what's your take on that because mm. mm. oh, look i think one of the one of the drivers for this is that they are finding um well, early the early drivers were disc hernias uh, occur in asymptomatic subjects and so the the big jump was discs don't hurt mm. or disc hernias don't hurt now, you could actually create the same bias in studies by, by looking at only people with back pain, which had been done at that point, and say, well, a person's got pain, they've got a disc hernia, therefore the disc hernia is causing the pain. And so those are biased, biases at two ends of the spectrum. Um, and so one bias was pathology hurts, the other one was pathology doesn't hurt. Um, but what's being shown now is that there's actually interplay Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and one of the, my favourite studies was by Dombrowski. Um, the IS, they got the ISSL Award for Bioengineering um, in 2018, I think it was, where they showed uh, that rather than studying it from um, asymptomatic or asymptomatic, they did it from a different direction. They just got people with a specific pathology, mm -hmm. which was um, lumbar, um, the genitus spondylolisthesis at one level. Specific. And they mm, and they did open MRI with them and measured quite accurately and sensitively the, the motion segment movement with flexion extension, so flexion extension. And so they were able to uh, calculate and measure where the axis of rotation was, evolute, convolute, uh, angulation, uh, all that sort of thing. Now, uh, contextually, they were pretty similar to the other studies, meaning their range of lumbar flexion generally was similar, age group, gender, so forth. But what was really interesting was that they would one variable distinguish the people with symptomatic degenerative spondylolisthesis and the asymptomatic ones, which was lumbar instability. But instability doesn't exist. Well, the lumbar instability differentiated the symptomatic and asymptomatic groups. And that's the question you now, said before about thirst and uh, dehydrated, because people say, oh, why, why are yeah. so, so many people are trying to uh, actually um, uh, create stability in their spine. It doesn't exist. Your spine is always stable. And I'm like, what? Well, you know, you can, uh, for me, I do a lot of analyses on a spectrum. Go to one end of the spectrum extreme, slip it back to the opposite extreme, and then come to something in the middle and see how they might connect. Um, and you could say, well, take um, a 14-year-old boy or girl, doesn't matter, do, doing elite baseball, and see how their elbow is. 
Now, you're going to produce a number of kids who need the Tommy John operation at a young age and other ones that don't. But if you don't play your baseball that way, if you're not the pitcher, then are you going to need that surgery? Probably never. And so, and I like the Kirk Holdy Willis type stuff in lumbar stability years ago. He said it's not just about whether it's stable; it's about whether they're using it that way, or whether they're provoking it and, exactly. and overusing it and so forth. And, and so, we still have not got to the level of analysis where we can measure a number of variables that produce contributing factors. And but these, the Dobrovsky study was an open opener for me because it showed that, well, you know, you're old when you when you think this is funny. I'd much rather have a, a hard to than a floppy disk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And um, so for me, it's about conspira- a conspiracy of factors and, and you've got to be able to test it. And so posture, coming to posture, it's the same situation. You get asymptomatic people who've got lousy posture. You've got symptomatic people who have pretty good posture. Um, but now, um, they, and if you test the, the biases by um, connecting variables, there's now two studies now, systematic reviews that show close associations between dyskinia and low back pain. But we don't like those studies. Of course not. Uh, and yes, there are going to be people that are symptomatic, but that doesn't mean that's a rule. And we know that- Exactly. Rate- we know the neural and, and innervations so, of the discs that they can reproduce yeah. that. So why do we have to go always to the one extreme and not just try to? Yeah, exactly. It's about yeah, it's about connecting people now with posture. Uh, there actually was a recent study that showed people who had um, subacogenic headache had more craniovertebral angle than than um, people who don't. Um, but in any case, on a bigger perspective. Um, you, you can see someone's posture, they have pain, change their posture, there and then their pain changes. Well, there you have it. You know, irrespective of what the, the large studies do say, this individual responds really well to changing their posture and for, for looking at other variables such as palpation and tenderness and way they move, muscle function, strength, all that sort of thing. Then you say, well, if you can, we can get your function better, then it's going to change your posture or change your posture to at least ease your pain transiently, then build on it. And, I really, and an extreme case, there's a lady I saw quite a while ago who she's in her mid 60s or somewhere between mid 60s and early 70s, um, a grandmother um, who's building up to cooking for Christmas. Now, that's a big job, you know, and, and you know, hopefully the family's in there helping as well. But um, she was planning all this and she developed a radiculopathy in her arm for her in her neck, of course. Um, and I said to her, um, so pins and needles, pain down your arm, when is it worst? Because you really, you want to nail that provoking factor. And she said, well, actually, I wake up with it at night. Mm. And so my next question is going to be, what's your sleeping position? <laughs> and she lay on her front, stuck her arm under her head, and she was leaning, sleeping prone on her front, closing her frame in all night. And I said, well, <laughs> there's the problem. <laughs> And I said, you're going to have to change your sleeping position. And she said, no, I can't do that. It's a habit. I said, well, I will tape your neck so you can't get there. And she said, no, 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 I'll try. <laughs> that was a uh, uh, Yeah, yeah. And, you know, t- two or three visits later, she had no more symptoms. And, and her neurological functions returned to normal. And so um, that's a posture. But it's an extreme one. Now, if extreme ones can produce big effects then what about smaller ones that are being intruded on by other activities? That's, that was going to be my question, exactly. You know, and, and what about sustained positions in, in an, an undesirable uh, position? Or, um, you know, when you're running, your lumbar pelvic movements are all over the place. And we know that when you land on your heel, you do a lordosis and it increases pressure around your nerve root. We know that. It's been measured. And, and so let's just show you how to do your lumbar pelvic control get a bit more hip extension instead of lumbar extension uh, let's say you how to protect your nerve so i'm gonna what you've been doing is running on your nerve and i'm gonna show you how to run off your nerve Please, yeah. master, Roland, and so as you said now regarding the hip hinge way of running rather than just using your lumbar all the time is mm. is a massive because a lot of people especially in lockdown and i know you've seen your clinic a 
lot of people said I was just running and my back went. Mm. Mm -hmm. look, yeah, look, I, 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 look, as far as I'm concerned, there are a lot of factors that we have to consider. You have to be skilled, open-minded, and be able to test a lot of things, multi-skilled, if you will. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm not keen on biasing. Um, up, top down or bottom up you know top down works really well and I've done it with some patients um, but there are certain there's certainly a bigger and bigger group of people that are coming now saying I've been told it's in my head and um, now I feel invalidated and, and I can't change the way I think distort automatically and the way I experience the world uh, and so what else have I got and what's interesting is invalid comes from the word valid invalid yeah, and, and so people are, are feeling um, uh, disappointed, frustrated um, at being told stuff that they can't change. Uh, always. Actually, I believe yeah. because words matter, we're creating more problems if we say to your patients in your head. Um, mm, yeah, actually, I agree. And, you know, the big, one of the big ones is radiology. Um, don't do radiology. You might scare the patient. Well, if you scare the patient, then the patient will get scared. And, and so um, I've never had a problem illustrating radiology to patients because I primed them and said, look, you know, you've got to remember this, this, and this. Um, and by the way, discs like movement anyway. And so let's help your disc, whether it's protruding or not. And, and so and there's a recent study, and I, I'm, I can see why this is found. Um, they did a study on people with chronic low back pain, and they asked them, what are their main concerns? open stuff and a number of them a, a large number one of the themes was we haven't been investigated so we are not going to engage in rehab because we're concerned that something serious might be wrong and it might not be safe to do all these blimmin' exercises now probably it would have been but um th they had a mental block or an obstacle which was we don't feel that we're being taken seriously so we're not going to engage until we are now uh, so for me perfect opportunity do radiology and say to the patient okay would you like do you, do you would you feel that you would like to eliminate anything serious in your back through radiology and they, they would obviously say yeah sure and so you do radiology and but before then you say look you've got to remember that you're at a certain age you, you, you there are imperfections in your body that don't necessarily produce pain and i said I'm, I'm, my, my nose is a bit bent to my left so i say to the patient see my nose is twisted to the left um but i can still smell everything uh, and, and so um the, you kind of have primed them to accept that it may not give them all the answers but it might reassure them that something serious is not there excellent and they then you know, and so again, we jump into an extreme, um, where, and when we lose the core values and the skills that we need to still apply, and education is one of them. So educate them, but you can't educate someone about radiology as easily as if compared with if they have had radiology. <laughs> well, well we, the, key, the key components for uh, your uh, practitioner of the future. What would be your advice for every, everybody that listens? And wants to be a real um, well, Okay, before I do that, I, just, I'm, I still hope people aren't thinking that I'm saying do radiology on everyone. Oh, that's 100 not going no, no, no. to help. It's a tool. Right. Just it's in a tool. specific circumstances, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so look, um, I'm thinking of sort of big picture here. Um, keep your enthusiasm because, you know, there is so much head spam out there. Um, what we shouldn't be doing is coming into our heads every day. Um, and and I, for me, my resilience to that is trust what you see. Believe what you see, because if you saw it happen, it happened. Um, and the, the question is not that it happened, it's how and why and how might we change it. Um, and also be careful about generalizations, um, particularly from one study or a subject that's not been studied extensively. Um, another one would be be flexible and open-minded. Another one would be test your ideas. Mm. And, and so if, you, if you've got an idea about a patient and you know how they work, how it functions, test it. And if it's positive or abnormal, good, okay, if you find something, if it doesn't, good, don't be biased, go on to something that's more productive. What's next now, Michael? I know things are a bit uh, crazy now with all the COVID situation. Uh, any mm. webinars, any teaching? What's, what's the plan? 
I know we uh, teaching. Five. Yes. Now um, I'm now doing hybrid courses, okay. which I, which I was surprised. Uh, it actually worked quite well. Um, I, I'm doing in-person stuff in Australia, if and when the borders um, open or close. It's a bit variable at the moment. Um, but um, I can't travel internationally because the Australian government are saying you go away. We're not going. We're not. We may not let you back. And so I'm staying home. Um, I'm doing a lot of. Um, I'm creating online material um, for for neurodynamics. Um, I'm basically videoing all the material, um, hands-on treatment techniques on models. Um, when when is it going to be out? Um, un, unknown at this stage. I've done about seventy, recorded about seventy-five percent of the content, wow. and I'm. Yeah, it's a huge job, huge job. But I'm enjoying it, and it's going to be worthwhile. Having said that, the material that I've recorded is we're being is being used on hybrid courses now. Uh, I remember I did a course a few a few weeks ago in Poland, but in Australia, um, um, I do the live presentations with the powerpoints and discussions and questions. And one of my local trained instructors. Um, taught locally with all the people converging into a hotel and did a proper seminar there. And so he was able to supervise the, the practical stuff. I played the videos on the patients and the models. So the little angles and descriptions were there. They go and practice and then we re-meet in you know, half an hour and go back over it again. And so that seemed to work really well. I'm surprised, but it, it's um, probably not as, the same as having me there, but it's still pretty good. Um, and uh, in the long term, we'll be doing certifications and things like that. But uh, but, we'll, but geez, that's a that's a wee while away yet. Perfect. And I'm looking forward because we said we're going to have a chat regarding if we're going to be doing a couple of webinars together. And um, absolutely, yes, absolutely for the in vivo kind of uh, seminars. Hopefully mm. soon. Mm, absolutely, yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it, and uh, um, well done on a great uh, podcast. It's really good. Thank you. Thank good question. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.